Virgin Media Shorts, championing undiscovered talent. Okay, welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon's session. Um, just to introduce myself uh, first as the chair of the session, my name is Caroline Cooper Charles um, and I work for Creative England as part of their talent team. Um, the role of Creative England is to support and nurture filmmaking talent of all types um, from uh, the English regions. I'm really um, delighted to be joined today by uh, Regan and by, um, by Matt. Unfortunately, Ben Roberts, who is listed up here on the slide from the, um, from the BFI Film Fund, we just heard has, uh, has actually gone into hospital. He's not very well at all. So uh, we're very sad, especially as he's one of the judges uh, this year's judges for Virgin Media Shorts that he uh, he can't be with us, but um, I'm sure he's with us in spirit. <laughs> um, so just to um, tell you a little bit about what we're going to cover in this afternoon's session, we're talking about <coughs> a really tricky transition um, that that is the kind of the short film to to the feature film. I think a lot of people kind of find that a real challenge, and I know having worked in um, film funding and with short filmmakers for very many years myself, it's always the kind of the thing that people say, how, how, how do you make it work? How does it happen? Uh, and we've obviously got re two really great examples here um, of, of people who've managed to make that transition very successfully. And um, what we're going to do first is just um, have a look at one of uh, Matt's feature films. Unfortunately, the clip that we have for Fast Girls, the resolution wasn't great. So rather than show you something which isn't um, really representative <laughs> of how fantastic the film is, um, we're just going to um, <coughs> show you first uh, a clip from uh, Matt's feature, Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll. Occasionally, one's behaviour makes one uh, ashamed of oneself. I'm glad to hear it. One, two, three. See what your old man is to go through every day? What a palaver. No one out there is going to help you. You've got to do it for yourself. And all on our own, remember? No, Dad. I'm here. People like me do not want sympathy. They want respect. <laughs> Everyone has their weakness. My weakness is loving him. Hit me with your ribbon stick. Hit me. Hit me. It's good, say fantastic. Hit me, hit me, hit me. Hit me with your ribbon stick. It's nice to be alone, I say. Hit me. Hit me. Do you always wear those glasses? For your protection, my dear. <laughs> What was wrong with that? That's perfect. Do you want to just sort of tell us a little bit, kind of, about how how that came about sure. and and um, you know, kind of where it, where it was in your career? And obviously, you've gone uh, gone on to do a couple more features now. So. Right. Um. Well, it was. Um, can anyone hear me? Does that yes. work? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I. Well, I, so I, when I was growing up, I'm just like the potted history, basically, it was, when I was growing up, I didn't really know of any way of getting into the industry. I didn't know anyone 
in the industry. It just felt like it was completely impossible. So when I finished university, I was just doing stuff on camcorders and, and so on. I started working as a runner for a company called Revolution Films, which is Michael Winterbottom and Andrew Eaton's company. And so I did that for a bit, but at the same time I was going off and doing my own shorts. And then I did a film with, uh, co-directed a film with Michael Winterbottom called Road to Guantanamo. So that was kind of the first, that was my first really big step up. And I'd done shorts and music videos and things, just, you know, shooting anything, you, using whatever you could. Our friends are actors, our friends are in bands, so we're just, just kind of getting practice in that way. And the Sex and Drugs had the same producer as on Regan's film. Uh, Damien approached me about doing a documentary about Banksy. Um, Banksy had seen Road to Guantanamo, he'd used clips from Guantanamo in, in one of his installations, and he emailed me and Michael and basically said, uh, I've decided to use some clips from your film, I haven't got your permission, there's not much you can do about it, but I'm sorry if you disapprove. <laughs> so we so were like, okay, but that's fine. And then he sent another one, we got an, an email through Damien saying that he knew someone, he knew Banksy, was just like, for whatever, for whatever reason, there was some kind of connection, somebody sells his, his work in galleries, and would we be interested in doing a documentary? And Michael was doing another film by then, so Damien approached me. And he got to the point where we were about to start making that film, and then uh, Banksy decided he didn't want to do it anymore after we booked our plane tickets to go and meet him in LA. So, um, so suddenly we were kind of left, having made that relationship, met Damien, we got on really well, and he said, well, would you be interested in doing a film about Ian Jury, which is that, the, the clip you just saw. So, um, and I said no, because I didn't really know anything about him. And he came back to me, he's really stubborn, he's really persistent, and he doesn't really take no for an answer, so he kept on coming back and saying, yeah, 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 this is the film we're going to make together. And at a certain point, after I'd done a bit of research, and I'd met Andy, who's the main actor in it, I kind of thought, well, why am I being such an idiot? This is, this is a really great opportunity, this is a really interesting project, and just because I don't know the music that well, I don't really know the time that well, then that's, not a, that's probably a better reason for doing it rather than a reason against. Okay, great. And Regan, Tell us a bit about the Fire Scales then, how yeah, that happened. <laughs> a similar story to, to Matt really, that was sort of, um, you know, graduated from film school, worked hard, I worked as an editor for about four or five years and just sort of shot stuff in my spare time and all that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, making short films, la 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 as you go. Um, and then basically I spent a couple of years saving up to do kind of what I was going to call my sort of kick art short film, as it were, the sort of one I was hoping would open, open the doors for me. Uh, which is called Three Hours, which is like an all Iraqi war drama. So I sort of went off and I made that, entered it into a few festivals, and it did quite well. Uh, and at the same time, I'd sort of spent about four or five years developing scripts. So, uh, you know, working with writers, and I had, you know, three or four ideas on the go. And there was one that was kind of like a, a teen horror thriller, which was kind of going to be my first film, which was about sort of, you know, 750 grand mark, you know, one that's sort of manageable to get independently made. Uh, and over the course of about three or four years, I had all sorts of ups and downs with it, until finally I had a producer want to make it for two million pounds in uh, Hungary. So that was kind of like, you know, the, the door opening project. Uh, and then he went and uh, had the first meeting with the finances, and they said, oh, we've just seen a film like this, it's just been finished. Uh, did you show it to this company called AV Pictures? And I was like, what? And uh, there was a company that wanted to make it two years previously, had actually taken the idea and gone and made it themselves. So that was quite heartbreaking. That was kind of the one door opening project that I sort of spent three or four years developing. Um, so I found out that news and I was all depressed. And then about a month later, I got an email just pop up in my inbox from Damien Jones saying, Hi, I'm Damien Jones, a producer of Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll and the Iron Lady. Uh, I got your name from the film council. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about a film called Fast Girls. And I sort of looked at my computer, going, "You don't sort of receive a random email <laughs> like that every day." And um, and basically, it was off the back of, of you know my short film that had been doing the rounds and put me on the attention of the film council, now the BFI, um, that the contact was made. And uh, we met and talked about the scripts, ways to to develop it and head it off and it went from there really. So lots of ups and downs. <laughs> I, I think that's really interesting actually that both of you have had, you know, had, I mean not exactly the same experience but a similar experience of, of ending up with your first fiction feature being a kind of film but, uh, you know, kind of an idea that a producer 
kind of yeah. brought to you, and yeah. I don't think that anybody really imagines that that, that happens. No. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody kind of assumes that your first feature will be the thing that you've struggled for years and years and years over, and tried to get finance, and then gone out and made a, a, on a on a shoestring. I mean, could you could you ever have imagined, uh, you know, when you were kind of first starting out, that those you know, the, the, the films that you made as your first features would, would, have, would you have imagined in a million years? I, I never really imagined I'd ever get a chance to make a film, to be honest, full stop, let alone anyone would ever see it. And I hadn't really got that far into the process of imagining how it happened. I was just really, just really keen to go out and, and learn how the, the kind of the nuts and bolts of how you actually shoot something. And then, yeah, all the, all the projects, and similarly, all the projects that I took to people that I wanted to make, I mean, one was, was about Iraq, another one was about child soldiers, another one was about a London bombing. This is before the, London, the, the actual London bombing. And all of them were, you know, quite heavy, um, possibly a bit indigestible, a bit worthy maybe, or maybe they were works of genius and they never got made, but for whatever reason, they were, everyone was like, oh, God, you know, and you'd go through that process for years, just going in, same meetings, and no one really says no, they're just going to go, oh, what a great idea. And then you kind of leave the office kind of going, right, does that mean it's happening or not? I'm not really sure. And then, you, and then like four months later, you're back in the same office and they go, yeah, it's a good script. And then they start talking about something else. And it's weird. I think my general impression is that it's not that people are bad people. It's just that it, obviously it's very costly. So anyone, as soon as someone says yes, then they're actually committing themselves to making a lot, to spending a lot of money. So that's very scary for them. They don't want to say no because it might be like the next king's speech in which case they're going to lose their job in a year when it, someone else makes it and it's brilliant. So they're just going to go, oh, yeah, that's interesting. For years, like, for, for, for the rest of your life. And so that happened to me for a really long time. And then which Damien just kind of came on board. And, and, sex, and sex and drugs seemed like, a, like a, a, an interesting project. But actually, weirdly, we went through a long period where that wasn't going to happen, wasn't going to happen. Everyone hated you know, the whole idea of it. They didn't like him as a person. They didn't, hadn't heard of the music. They didn't like the script because it was really weird. <coughs> And then eventually one person said yes, and my general experience has been as soon as one person says yes, then if you're lucky, there's a bit of a feeding frenzy. No one wants to be the first to make the jump, and as soon as they do, then hopefully no one wants to be the person who misses out. So they'll come in for little tiny chunks, and then you try and build up the budget. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't imagine I'd be doing someone else's idea for, for a first feature. No, likewise. I mean, um, you know, an all-girls sports drama wasn't really so high on my list of priorities. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of, you know, any opportunity is a, a good opportunity. I think the secret, you know, if, if, if you're doing any job, but especially directing, is to um, do your homework and just jump at every opportunity that's put in front of you that gives you a chance at sort of pushing you forward. Um, you know, it's like you, you were humming and hiring about taking the sex and drugs on at the beginning. It's kind of um, life only hands you an occasional golden ticket sometimes, and you've got to jump at it and be fully committed, I think. And if you apply that to, um, from making short films all the way up to features, I think, you know, just having that mentality will help. I, I just wanted to ask you both a little bit about the budget levels for the films because obviously you've talked about risk and I think that's one of the things that obviously is, is foremost in, in financiers' minds when they're, when they're working with a first-time feature director. It's like, well, okay, it's a risk because we, you know, we don't know whether they can deliver a feature and it's a bigger risk because it's a bigger amount of money than a, than a short film and, and so often first-time feature makers have to work with extremely restricted budgets. So was that the case for you, or were you allowed a little bit more? Not really. I mean, the budget for Sex and Drugs was about two million quid, which to the, for me at the time, I was just like, that's ridiculous. <coughs> how, you know, how are we going to spend all that? We had the, the best rap party ever. Because they came back and we budgeted it, and obviously you start off by being generous in the budget, and we came in just over that. I was thinking, how the hell are we going to spend all that? And actually, as soon as you factor in, really just, just personnel, so as you start paying crew and cast, and then you add into that music, and then the equipment, and then insurance, and then you've got to pay a bond company. So by the end of that process, it's not enough. And so every single day we go, well, you know, what, can we really not have a crane for that scene, which completely depends on the crane. You go when you can, but then, you've got to, then you can't have 100 extras, you can't have this, you can't have that. And so it's, um, yeah, two million quid seemed like a lot, mm -hmm. but actually disappears quite quickly. You know, I think Matt's rap party actually led to me having less money. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, our, our, our total budget was, was 1.6, which below the line was about 850 grand. 
uh, uh, below the line is basically everybody apart from the heads of department <coughs> and, and your actors. So um, I actually had more trouble, I think, making fast girls than I did making anything else I've ever done because, you know, I was having to go through and pinch from every day, you know, okay, we can lose two extras from that day, that saves us 300 quid, you know, we can have a steady cam on a total of five days, which scenes can we arrange so we can we can do that? So uh, it, it, I think as independent filmmakers, we get used to trying to put as much of that money on the screen, and I think um, uh, unlike sort of the Hollywood movies and all that kind of stuff, every penny counts, and you'd be surprised if somebody throws a figure of a million pounds at you, how how little that, uh, that actually gives you once you're you know, paying people and travel costs and locations and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't go far. Okay, well we talked a bit about you know, each of your first films. I want to go back and talk a little bit about the, the route to getting there, we, which we've um, we, which we touched on briefly, but tell us, did you both always kind of start out thinking what I want to do is make a feature film. Would shorts, uh, you know, was it, was there a kind of strategy there in terms of doing shorts and then kind of moving through? Or I, I because I knew from like from a really early age that I wanted to be a film director, but I didn't really know how you became one. I didn't really know what it involved, to be honest. I just you just see the pictures and you see someone sat behind the camera and they're supposedly in charge. And you go, oh, that'd be amazing. So you're kind of telling the story. You don't really know what what it means. And I think actually getting to that point was just seemed completely impossible to me because I remember you know you go at a school I didn't know anyone who was who was involved in the industry I didn't know not even like you know, there were no parents of mates there was one of my one of my mates his, his dad was a cameraman for the BBC but again it's like it's not like they had any kind of connections to, to anything that I wanted to do particularly and um yeah so I just would go off with my dad's camcorder and just start shooting bits and pieces and my my general I thought well maybe I could go to film school but at the time it was like, so I remember it was kind of like more like a postgrad thing you might do. And I talked to lots of different people, like, is it a good idea, is it not a good idea? And they were like, well, yeah, but maybe you should go off and do a different degree first. And I kept on shooting all my own stuff. And I, th I think that was the best kind of film school for me initially, was just like, look, well, I had no means. So I just had a kind of a camcorder. You had to do all the editing in the camera. And so you're watching stuff and you go, well, why doesn't that work? You know, but at least you're failing, you know, kind of silently, <laughs> quietly in, in the background. You know, you're making these terrible films and yet, Somehow they, like, they've got no audience for them, so that was quite good. And by the time I, I'd finished uni, I'd made like a few shorts, made a few music videos, I was just playing around with the camera the whole time, just filming everything that was going on. And I remember there was like a demonstration, we had a, a sit-in a, a demonstration against the, the cuts. And so I filmed all that and then cut that into something just to show other people the next time we met up. And so it was just kind of learning that way. And when I finished, I started working at Mike Winterbottom's company, and he was always... The first meeting I ever had, the well, first time he ever came into the office when I was there, he said, well, what is it you want to do? And I said, I want to be directed. Well, do you have any practical experience? Can you shoot? Can you edit? And by that stage, I, I kind of could. So he got me doing bits and pieces on his film, shooting second camera or editing the trailer together. And then he kept on saying that use, use the equipment. We've bought all this equipment. You should just go and use it, you know, as long as you can shore it and you bring it back in one piece. So we'd go off and, and shoot things. And then I heard about the, the film council, as it was at the time, was starting up this scheme. Well, no, they had this scheme that they did every year where they give you 10 grand to do a, a short film. You had to pay everyone, and you could shoot over two, day, uh, two days, I think it was. And there were a few stipulations, but it was, it was great. And you had to go in, and there was a, a kind of some, some training before you started. So we did that, and it took quite a long time, the whole process, but when we finished it, it was amazing, because they stuck all the films on the front cover of Sight and Sound. They sent it off to loads of people. So suddenly, you went from being a bit of a joker, like a, a kind of running around just filming mates on whatever you could, to suddenly going in for meetings. It didn't actually lead to anything particularly, but you just you meet everyone. Everyone kind of says, I'm sure they say this to everyone, they go, your film is the best film that's ever been made, you're a genius, and we want to make whatever you want to do next. And you come out floating on air from every one of those meetings, and they never lead to anything. But it was really, but at least you've met people, and it kind of feels like you can actually call yourself a director and not say, I want to be a director. That's, that was amazing for me. So the, so the short for you, in a, in a way, was a kind of your first way of kind of engaging with the industry as a director, yeah. as opposed to somebody kind of working, you know, right, being company an editor. And, yeah. in, a, in another capacity. And did you, I mean, it, it sounds uh, as if, you know, kind of 
working working with Michael Winterbottom and working in, in that environment <coughs> actually you know and having access to the equipment was was a real um, was obviously a complete bonus. Um, I, I mean I know and have met people who say oh if you really want to be a director it's not a very good idea to work in another capacity because then you get pigeonholed as an AD maybe or as something else. Yeah. Would you? I mean what what would you guys think about that? Um. I know it's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I came to England in, in 2000 looking for work as an AD, looking for anything, and uh, couldn't find anything. I ended up working as an editor for about three or four years. Um, editing A is actually a really good training ground for a director. B means you've got a job that pays the rent and all that kind of stuff, uh, and also gives you equipment. Um, so that was good for me in the fact that it it gave me the opportunity to go and shoot stuff on the weekends and the evenings and also learn from other people's mistakes because, you know, I, I was working with guys who were making their first or second music video or the occasional short film and sitting in the edit suite meant I was, you know, I, I, I didn't have to go out and make the mistakes that they had made of getting shitty sound or not shooting a wide shot or, or, or that kind of stuff. So I wouldn't say that if you want to be a director, just direct because there's also surviving. And I know a lot of a lot of guys, you know, from that I was working with ten years ago, who, you know, who gave up on the dream after you know three years because that's exactly what they were doing. They were kind of, you know, on a benefit, just trying to be a director. Um, and it's hard to survive if you don't have a job. Um, and I think in the way that you know. Most, I don't want to speak to you about you've got sort of music videos and stuff like that in the background. I've got commercials that I've come up with. So I've kind of got a fallback position um, that allows me to take risks. And I think when you're wanting to be a director, risk taking is a big part of the job because um, you've got to spend money on your own productions. You know, you've got to gamble with your future, you know, I don't have a mortgage, all that kind of stuff. So um, you need to be in a solid position whereby the basics are taken care of and you can go off and you can dedicate two weeks to making a short film or you can spend a month not earning anything if you've got a fallback position. So, yeah, long story short, I, I think that if you want to be a director, just saying you're a director I think is a risk. More than anything. <laughs> I don't know how you feel. Um, and would you say that, that uh, I mean, you talked about being able to work with music videos and, and commercials. Would you say that that kind of nowadays is, is potentially a kind of a, an easier route through to, to features than, than television. I mean, I think in the past people probably kind of thought, oh well, if I you know if I do TV and I get my TV credentials, then that will hopefully lead on to some feature filmmaking. I don't I don't know because the, the problem is the bottom's kind of falling out of the music video industry and the and, the, and commercials. There's still still I mean obviously there's still a lot of money in commercials, but <clears throat> they're coming down. It's not quite it's not the golden age anymore. I, for me, it was like I don't really mind. Obviously, what I really want to be doing is is dramas and documentaries, but if I get a chance to go and play around with the camera uh, for a week or for a few days, and then get to get immediate response from a, from an audience with music videos, for example, it's it's, it's amazing. You know, I think mm. the tricky thing that I've always found, which is obviously completely counterintuitive, but that actually the least experienced person, generally speaking, on a film set is the director, and he's the one who's telling everyone what to do, which is really odd. And I just the reason for that is obvious because it takes a long time to try and set up film up. We're not in the, you know, the kind of, uh, the golden age of Hollywood studios where you'd go, you'd make three films a year. You may, if you're a prolific director, you make a film a year, maybe a film every two years, you know. And so inevitably you have to rely on other people a lot. And <clears throat> so in the same way that Regan was saying, I just, I learned how to, like, I'm not the world's best cameraman, I'm probably not the world's best editor, but I learned how to do both those things. So at least you know what to ask of other people. And again, you know, you, you have to, the same with producers, you just need to know enough about the detail of financing, that you are not unreasonable, but you can also be pushy when you need to be. If something isn't getting out there, or, or someone's not doing their job, you just need to know that that's what's happening. You just need to have your, you know, to be aware of what's going on. But I think, yeah, in terms of music videos or TV, I was just happy to do anything, to be honest. Um, although I spent a long time turning stuff down because actually the majority of stuff that you get sent, especially when you're starting out, it really isn't very good. And even later on, it's amazing how about 95% of the stuff that you get sent is really, really bad, whether it's a project just as an idea or a, or a script. 
And what amazes me still is you kind of reading, it's not like I'm in the top echelon of directors, but the amount of stuff you get sent from by quite good writers or quite big writers, and you're sitting there kind of going, this is terrible, this is actually getting made. And you kind of feel, well, I've been in this situation a couple of times recently when I've gone, well, it's a terrible script, but maybe I can make it, like the project, the idea is good enough, which is a really bad situation to be in. So I think, yeah, to be honest, it's more about practical experience. You just want to try and get a chance to do as many things as possible. So for me, I've got some TV things hopefully lined up. I've got some features potentially lined up, a music video, just and whatever goes first, because nine times out of 10, the thing doesn't happen. So unless you're juggling 40 different plates, you probably end up not working, which yeah. is pretty much. Yeah, so keep keeping your options open. Yeah, it? don't be precious. I think that, like you were saying, I mean, I've got, had lots of people I've met who are like, no, I'm, I'm, my short has to be on 35 mil. You're fucking crazy. Just, and then they made it. They made this shoot the short, and it's terrible. And they go, oh, well, I'm not cut out for it. But you'd never do that in any other profession. You'd never pull out you know, the canvas and go, no, I'm not Picasso, right? Forget it. You, you paint and paint and paint and paint. And because film's so expensive, most people end up not doing that. But actually, it's getting easier to try that, try that in private or be an editor for a bit, be a director for a bit, whatever, you know, just try different things out. Yeah. When I was at film school, uh, everything we made was on Super VHS. Um, it's like it's 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 completely unwatchable. Whereas now, you know, camera and editing facilities are so good and so cheap that the great thing is that in your spare time or even at film school, you're making short films that are at a wonderfully broadcastable quality, um, and that's already a huge plus because ten years ago it was so much so different. You know, so um, the tools are there. But just going on from what Matt was talking about with sort of just technical experience with camera and editing and things like that. Script writing, I think, is a really um, underappreciated part of, of the skill set. And I think the reason I got the job for Fast Girls wasn't so much for my technical ability. It was because I'd spent um, a few years developing scripts myself, going to script writing courses, um, that I was able to understand the picture from a script point of view just as much as from a visual one. And um, I, I never thought that really I'd be getting my first gig as a director based on my knowledge and understanding of script, but that's kind of the way that it went. Okay. And with your, uh, to just talk a little bit about the, the, the short that you did, Three Hours, yeah. I mean, would, was that something that you both wrote and, and directed? It was based on a newspaper article I, I, I found in the, in the paper about a, a massacre of some, some kids in, in, in Baghdad and um, I'd sort of kept it knowing that it was an idea I loved, I've sort of got a folder of ideas. Um, the first step was actually saving enough money to make a short film, so I sort of over the course of one or two years saved up about 15 grand. Um, and then when it came time to go, okay I've got some money in the bank, which film am I going to make? I pulled out that article and said that's still the idea that I love and I actually took it to, I was doing a feature writing course at the time and I took it to my tutor and I said uh, you know I want to make a short film, there's this idea that I really like, would you help me write it? So he came on board as the writer and together we, we turned it into a script. Okay. Um, we're just going to now, I hope, <laughs> uh, have a look at um, Matt's short film. Uh, Job, Job Street, Street, which is the, the film that Matt was talking about that was funded through the UK Film Council short films.
Ne t'inquiète pas, mon amour. Tout ira mieux. Tu verras. Uh, unfortunately, we've not got time to watch the the, the film. Was ten minutes, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we've yeah. unfortunately not got uh, time to watch the whole film there. But I hope that gives you a a, a flavour of the of the uh, type of short that it was. And um, Regan, tell us a little bit about. I mean, yours was based on a on a, as you say, a, 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 a sh short uh, story that you pulled from the newspaper. Yeah. Um. I, I think sort of just. Linking back to the sort of whole, whole idea of shorts to features, I think that this kind of a short films a mechanism to get you known by the industry, and um, there are a couple of different ways you can go about it. One is applying to short film funds like you did, and and, and you know based on the idea you get some money <coughs> to make a short film, um, or, or then or, or the other is just to go and make it yourself. And I was in the position whereby. I decided that this was the film that I wanted to make, so I applied both in, in England and, and, and my home in New Zealand for some short film funds. Uh, neither of them were interested because it wasn't um, qualified because, you know, for a film to be UK qualifying, you've got to kind of be making a UK story in the UK, spending the little bit of money that they give you in the UK, and vice versa with New Zealand. <coughs> so I realised that, okay, I'm going to have to go and make this myself. So I had. 15 grand to spend and I knew that 15 grand if you're making a, a shot of a shot it in Jordan and it was going to cost a lot more than that so I went and I found 15,000 through contacts of my own it took a few months but uh, one guy put in five grand and another guy put in two grand and another, another guy put in ten so in the end I effectively had 30 grand to make the film so um uh, a friend of mine was working on a on, on a film set one day, um, talking to a uh, talking to the production designer and just over coffee he says, "Oh yeah, we're trying to make a, a short film about uh, Iraq." And he goes, "Well, I've just got back from there making a sh making a film called um, The Hurt Locker. Uh, I can introduce you to some people." So that led to being introduced to Jordan and basically allowed the film to be made. But I was basically risking all of that money into making a quality piece of film that I'd hope might win an award in a, in a festival or something like that, but also prove that I can do some drama, I can do some action. So it was a gamble. Um, and did you, did you, I mean, Matt talked about the fact that because he, his short was funded through a, through a short film scheme, that actually there was quite a lot of promotion of the work that went along with that, so the Days and Confused DVD and, and and so it, there was a kind of automatically a way of getting the work out there in front of people. I mean, how did how did you go about that? Because if you've done something and it's self-funded, you've then still got that whole challenge of well, how do I get that in front of people? Definitely. Well, there were a couple of things that sort of happened in my in my favour. First of all, there's a book out there called the Guerrillas Filmmakers Handbook, um, which I had and I'd read. You know, which talks about getting the film into film festivals, but. Basically, I came back from the Middle East having having shot the film, and and you know I've got very little money for for editing, but I'm doing it in my own spare time. And uh, this thing called Virgin Media Shorts came up, and I'd done this little quirky film for a fashion magazine about six months beforehand that was 90 seconds long, and and somebody sent me an email about midnight when I was there editing my film, and uh, and I thought I'll. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here now, I might as well just upload the video and, and, and there you go. So I, I entered Virgin Media Shorts with this little fashion clip and forgot all about it and carried on editing for another couple of months until I got a phone call saying, well, you, know, we're think, you know, we're thinking of putting you on the long list for Virgin Media Shorts. And long story short, I was a finalist for this little fashion film that I did. So came along to the event and it was wonderful, a bit of red carpet, you know, the first time I've seen my my work on a, on a big screen and um, was hanging out at the bar afterwards and uh, there were some people next to me in the bar and I said, you know, what are you doing here? And they go, oh, we won the um, UK Film Council Short Film Completion Fund. And I went, I've heard about you guys. Um, I'm just finishing off a film that I, 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 I shot in the Middle East and, you know, I'm struggling a little bit in post-production. He goes, well, uh, our final funding round closes in, in two weeks. You should put in an application. And sure enough, I did, and, and we were accepted. So, um, 
that completion fund gave me seven and a half grand towards paying for a, paying for an editor to come on board and help me, and also for finishing the film, you know, doing a proper grade and, and sound mix and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, by being part of that completion fund, it meant that when it was finished, you know, it had a little bit of kudos to it, and it had the UK Film Council logo on it. Um, uh, but once that was done, it, it was then sort of put back into my lap, really, of, uh, okay, what am I going to do with this? And, and using that Gorillaz Filmmaker's <coughs> handbook, um, my assistant, Fabio, who's here, and I basically spent six months entering into a couple of hundred film festivals. Um, and if you're going to make a short <coughs> film and put as much money and effort into it as I, as I did, you want to make sure that your festival strategy is, is, is good because the whole point of risking all of that money and time is to get an award. So you want to cherry pick the best film festivals that you can uh, in the hope that maybe one or two of them will take you and, and then it all goes to shit. A year later you can enter it into the Utah Garage Film Festival VHS competition and, and maybe get something from that. But, um, uh, yeah, pay attention to your festival strategy, and it takes a lot longer and a lot more time, money, and effort than, than you think it, it will, because you think of all the efforts actually into making the film. But actually, the amount of DVDs and forms you've got to fill out and all that kind of stuff, <coughs> if I didn't have someone in the office helping me, I'd have probably given up after 10 or 15 festivals. And you've got to plow through and actually make the effort, and, and the effort's worth it. Yeah, I, I think that I mean I think that's really excellent advice to, to you know to to think about not I think I think the temptation after after making any film you know is is to just kind of go oh, I got through it and and but you can't stop that and I think that's when you know in lots of ways the job starts I mean even you know on on features where you have people paying for features you've got a, a year afterwards at least where you're going around doing the festivals etc etc. Um, so I think, I mean, both of your stories are, you know, I, I think are, are really, um, really good proof that shorts can be a, a, a fantastic calling card, whether you set out for them to be a calling card in, t <coughs> excuse me, in terms of getting um, recognition and getting a feature off the ground, not necessarily the one that you thought was going to be your yeah. first feature, but, you know, it, it allows people to see your talent and, and see that you have a voice. Um, I like <coughs> your voice. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, you know, aside from the challenge of, of, of finding the money and getting your, you know, getting your films out there and getting known within the industry, and the, the, in terms of, of from a creative perspective, in terms of, of actually making that move from shorts to, to features, what was the, you know, once you've got money and you're making it, what what's the biggest challenge there in in terms of the you know, from a creative perspective. Well, I think, in terms of the creatively, I, mean, I suppose it was like, the, the biggest hurdle for me, going from having done, was with the Guantanamo was with a kind of group of friends and people that I work with a lot, same crew each time, and, and so I'm working with Michael. And then, and the same on the shorts and so on, same, same kind of crew, and then moving and doing sex and drugs. I don't know whether you did on Fire Skills or not, but it was my first experience in Bond Company. I don't know if you guys, bless you, I don't know if you guys know about, um, about bond companies or not, but the basis, obviously, like, you insure the camera, so if someone steps on the camera truck and nicks your camera, you're not liable for it. But you also insure the film as a whole, and you go in, and the company, the bond company, says, okay, we think, with this budget, with this schedule, with this crew, with this cast, with this producer, this film will be made. It's not as we don't care about the quality of the film, but we'll have, like, a beginning, a middle, and end. We will be able to, the film will be finished. We guarantee that. You pay us quite a lot of money and we, we take on the risk in theory. But we also reserve the right at any point to step in and fire your director or fire whatever, you know, they, they can come in, they can be very nice and they can be quite heavy handed. And you hear all kinds of horror stories. And that happened to me on Sex and Drugs, that they, it was my first experience on a, on a, with Bond Company. And actually it was a good one, but it was quite scary because the, uh, you go in for the first meeting and they go, right, your cameraman isn't experienced enough. So we're gonna, you need to find a new cameraman. So you bring in another camera and you go, oh right, your editor, okay, we'll accept that editor, but they need to do this. And so actually, you end up not working the way you worked before, and not necessarily with the same people you worked with before. And obviously the, same, the other issues are the people that you kind of grew up with, they, you're inexperienced and they're inexperienced collectively, 
means that something's got to give. So they go, okay, well, yeah, we'll bring in another producer. They can look after you, whatever it might be. So suddenly it's slightly different from the way you worked before. And for the first week of Sex and Drugs, we had a nightmare because we were going over on the days. I mean, like, in the past, when I'd been, I hadn't been working to, we'd been working to a schedule, obviously. We were doing shorts and we were doing Guantanamo, but it was friends, really. So you get to the end of the day and go, right, we missed a few shots. Should we just we'll keep going? And you can't do that when it suddenly becomes you know, professional in a slightly different way. I mean, it's not, we were working with a big crew, and they, although they're very nice, the gaffer can pull the plug on the lights, and sometimes they do. You know, and, if you, and they'll give you a certain amount of leeway. The first few days, oh yeah, maybe you go over a bit. But on the third day, the Bond company stand up, you know, come along and stand behind the monitor and say, you don't need that shot. And you're sitting there, and you've got all the other pressures. And you're going, why, why are you shooting that? So you've got another voice as, uh, amongst all the other ones. So that, that was the biggest pressure for me. And it was a, a real issue of having stepped into the supposedly a professional world. And then after having done that, and not having been fired at the end of it, then it suddenly it was like, oh, I can, then, then they trust you. And the next one, they go, oh, you can bring in your old team. Will you? So that's the one thing was just trying to create almost like a family, whether it's the cast or the crew, just to have the same people going from film to film. So you know people have got their, your back. Otherwise, week one, you're all sizing each other up. And obviously that's footage that's going to end up in the final film, which is terrifying. You go in, spend the first day going, it's not right, it's not right. Oh, God, we didn't get that shot. And that's still going to be in the film. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have any rehearsal period. Yeah, I mean that must be a be a huge pressure to well to have all those extra elements on top of you and have the security blanket of all the people that you're used to taken away yeah, from you. Yeah, it's very weird. Did you find that to be the biggest challenge too, or were they? It, it, likewise, with my first experience with a Bond company, but mine was quite positive. I think that uh, through my background with commercials and having my own production company. I was used to spending other people's money, so um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a real schedule Nazi, so um, uh, luckily I didn't have, have, have that problem. Um, but certainly, you, as, he's, as Matt was saying, they're taking a risk on you as a first-time director, and you've got to understand the scale of that risk, because people are putting in a couple of million quid in your hands, and a lot of directors grow up with this sort of self-given right of, you know, I deserve to be given money to, to, to do my vision, but really you're one cog in a, in a big machine. And it's your duty to do your job right and spend their money well, because um, if you don't, every, you know, everything goes to shit. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's an important, important consideration. Um, I've got about a million and one other questions for you, but I'm just aware of the fact that we're really tight on time, so I'm going to open it up just to five minutes for, for questions. There's one at the back there. Hi, I'm the usher, and I probably don't have much right to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do of so anyway. You do. Um, I've kind of got three questions, so I'm going to kind of quick fire them because I don't have the right again. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about the script writing process for, for shorts. So typically you have a one minute, a two minute, a three minute, a five minute, a ten minute, or even a half an hour, and what that might take. Um, you know, your ambition for a short film may be for five minutes, but it might end up coming in shorter. I mean, how do you process that um, as, as directors or, or writers? That's my first question. Well, it's my experience. Again, I, I'm not a very good short filmmaker. I've got to say, I, I found it quite hard because I. I've grown up watching, I don't didn't watch that many shorts. I mean, it's, I think there, it's a bit, I always find it's a bit like the difference between writing a novel and writing a poem. It's like a, a brilliant uh, poet might not be a great novelist and vice versa. And I always tried to, I mean, you could get a sense of it in that little clip, but I'd try and, I'd kind of make a feature and then try and squeeze the narrative into 10 minutes, which isn't actually, doesn't, doesn't necessarily make the best kind of shorts. And um, a lot of successful shorts seem to be, almost like a meditation on an idea that might be really simple. There might only be three shots in a, you know, in a one minute film. And I think I, if I was going to kind of give myself advice back in the day, I would have said, well, you know, don't be so ambitious. Don't try and tell a really complicated story. It might just be a simple story of someone who loses something and looks for it, or a meeting, which may, and I think also in a way that it kind of lends itself often to, well, it can lend itself to kind of not-not gags, which is a bit of an obvious thing. It's like you set up a scenario and then it turns out there's a twist. But the better ones for me are the ones which kind of just hint at something. So it might be an encounter which you don't really understand or, or a kind of a moment between two people that almost could be just like transplanted from a bigger film and actually leave people wanting more. So I think in that sense, and, and the only way to know how long a thing is, I mean, traditionally in, in film, 
you go, well, one page is a minute, but actually that's kind of bollocks, because one line of it might be, you know, Germany invades Poland. That's presumably it's not going to be one minute of the film. I don't know. So, you know, it's, there's that kind of thing. I think it, it's, you just get an intuitive sense of it. And in terms of script writing, I, it's just trial and error, a bit like Regan was saying. I, I would just, I read a lot, I read scripts, I, I would write something, and I tend to find that a lot of writing, at least in this country, tends to be by people who maybe have a theatrical background. So they assume it's all to do with the dialogue, whereas actually my favourite moments in films tend to be dialogue free, or the dialogue is only one element in there, and actually they're much more to do with the visuals, or the combination of visuals and sound. So I think that's, uh, that's something to consider. Don't sit there worrying too much of that dialogue. I mean, again, if that's not one of your strengths when you're writing, well, don't worry about that. Maybe, the, maybe that's, it's the, you're the kind of director who wants to improvise on set and create a scenario instead. So I, I think you need to kind of figure out, don't, don't stick to thinking that there's only one way to write a good script. Um, I know you've got other questions, but I'm just, because we really are really I'm tight. I'm approach you after. Tight, sure. tight, tight on time. I just want to give other people an opportunity. Sorry. You just... Uh, as a young filmmaker wanting to make feature films, would you recommend to keep on making short films until there's one that has a lot of success, or would you just aim for making a feature film straight away? Um, I don't know, it's, it's a tough one. It's, it, practice makes perfect, and there's that whole thing of Malcolm Gladwell, I don't know if you've, any of you have read him, he says that 10,000 hours spent doing anything turns you into an expert. So making short films is a great way to experiment with a craft. But then again, there are a lot of effort, and I didn't spend 10 years making lots of sh little short films as a director. I helped other people make theirs. So when it came time for me to make mine, I knew I was going to make one that was big and kick-ass. So um, I s I've got a few friends who make one or two a year, and they're always tiny and go in shitty little film festivals, and, and they just repeat the cycle over and over, and I said, just st I feel like saying stop. You know, spend six months planning it, spend six months making it, and make something that's going <coughs> to open the doors for you. I, I think to say that straight off is a risk. I think, you know, you need to do stuff to practice, but when it does come time to make a short film, plan it. You know, I mean, there's things like if, if you want to get into international festivals, uh, you can't just have a two minute film got to have an 8 to 14 minute film in order to qualify for some festivals. Um, that length of time also allows you to have a dramatic arc in your story that you can't have in a knock knock joke two minute little film as well. And I think, you know, being able to tell a story on a dramatic arc is important. Um, I think I made a mistake with mine, a bit like you said, Matt, about trying to pack a feature, a three act structure into 10 minutes or 14 minutes is very difficult, but you know, I, I, I'd say once you've practiced enough, sit back, save some money, apply to funds, and, and make something good. Thank you. Probably have time for one more question. Maybe, okay. sorry, just here, and then, okay, two, two more, you'll have to be the last. <laughs> I'm just interested in. What kind of small scale funding are there? Like, what, 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 where would you, you know, what, what should, you should ask those people, you know, or funds possible? Well, Caroline's pretty better on this than me. I, I'd say, like, just in terms of, so you should probably talk more about the, the actual, the funds that are available. I mean, there's very few of them, although they're more starting up. But I think, um, well, on the other hand, like, you can, you can go Regan's route. And you can now, I mean, you can, you can borrow a camera, you can go off and shoot something for no, nothing. So I would suggest that you might want to shoot a few, if, depending on your level of experience, you might want to go and shoot a few things just to, just to try editing out for the first time. I mean, I, maybe you, this is all like you've, you've done all that anyway, but I just think like my preferred route was just to try a few things out, just learn the basics myself, and then see if you can get some money off someone else. But actually, you can still shoot a film for nothing, more or less, if you can blag enough of the equipment, the editing software you can get for you can borrow off someone, you can, you can get free. So I think, in that sense, it's, it's relatively simple. And then, just in terms of the way to approach it, I think, even at a smaller level, when you're asking for 10 grand or 5 grand, all the things that Regan said, which apply to feature film financing, are the same. You just want to, someone's giving you their money, and even if it's only a tenant, you still owe them an explanation of what you're doing. And actually, a script's only a small part of that. That's kind of the contract. You're kind of saying, well, it's going to be like this. 
but actually you can use all other kinds of methods. You can cut together scenes from other films, give them a, a kind of tonal idea of what the thing's going to be like. You might get lots of images off, uh, you know, from books or online and just kind of go, well, this is the kind of look I'm going for. You bring in your crew and you kind of have a level of experience. So I think those are the kind of things that they might possibly be wanting to, to hear from you, just going to go, look. And also, I suppose the other thing I try to do on my short was go, well, look, this is actually part of a bigger feature. So if you finance this bit, then actually I can use this as a stepping stone directly. And as it turned out, I never did the rest of that film. Or there was another one I wanted to do about Iraq, which was three parts. You know, so this was going to be the first part of the film, which was going to last 15 minutes, and then actually you could expand on that. So I think you just need to reassure them that not only is the money going to be well spent, but it's also going to further your career. Okay, very last question. Well, in terms of the funds, maybe, I don't know if there's a website or is there something that you can... Yeah, I mean, uh, I can have a quick quick chat with you afterwards but if you want but if you go to the Creative England website which is just creativeengland.co.uk there's information about the funds that are available at the moment and there will be more coming online uh, probably around April next year so there is although there's a there is a real scarcity of short film funding at the moment which has been there for a couple of years um, that we hope will be will be uh, resolved to some extent in the uh, in the coming future. So, one last question. Uh, really quick, what did you study before at university? I did. Well, I did English um, only because I well I love reading and I kind of felt like I wasn't very good at being taught at school. I wasn't very good at listening, and so I tended to find that teaching partly because I just had very bad teachers took all the joy out of anything, and I loved film so much, I just thought if I had someone telling me how to do it, then that was really going to piss me off and was going to put me off filmmaking. So I ended up doing English, which I really enjoyed, and I think helped with storytelling, I helped just reading things constantly, and, I just ended, and also, to be honest, I didn't do a huge amount of my degree, I just ended up watching a lot of films. So, in that sense, I think it was quite nice, it was a kind of buffer, and it meant, I mean, English isn't, doesn't, doesn't particularly lead you into any career, but it just felt like I learned a bit more about the world. I think you sometimes sense certain filmmakers that they're making films about films, they've seen a lot of films and they haven't really lived very much and I just I just got a chance to read all these books which were, you know, which ended up influencing films in different ways. So I think it's, it, to be honest, there's a million different ways to go through it and you might want to go to film school, you might want to go to uni, you might just want to go off and travel the world and just meet people. I don't think there's a, there's a proper way of doing it but for me it was just, it was a great experience. I met some of my best friends, we had some really good times, I ended up shooting some films while I was there. I met Coldplay, so I, you know, that, was, that was pretty cool. So I just, you know, I've ended up doing things with them and actually the, it was kind of what I, didn't, uh, what I did when I wasn't doing my degree that ended up helping me in, in my career. We're, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. I'm sure you have loads more questions you could ask these guys as I certainly do, but uh, just to say thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. That's been um, really, really fantastic and insightful and uh, encouraging, I hope, for uh, all of you guys who are out there who may want to make a feature yourselves one day. Thank you very much. Virgin Media Shorts, championing undiscovered talent.